Welcome back to the coverage of Weises Düsseldorf 2019, the second largest Yu-Gi-Oh! event in history, the largest in Europe of all time. We got 2,838 players spread over two tournaments. It's the first time ever that somebody cast Multiply on a YCS, and we said we're not just going to run one event, we're going to be running two events at the same time. That was yesterday. Today, both these events are running in the same venue. I can actually tell you guys that we're very likely going to be able to stream the finals of YCS Düsseldorf 2 here on the stream, but that's a little bit later today. Right now, the big story is this is the last round in Swiss in the main event of Weisses Düsseldorf 1. We got two players that are in this situation. If they win, they are in. If they lose, they can focus on public events for the rest of the day. It's not the worst thing that can happen, but if you're so close to making it to the top cut, you want to go all the way, you want to win this match. We got two guys, no pressure, in the red corner, Thomas Weber from Switzerland. Hey, come here, please. How are you doing, How are you doing today? I'm fine. I mean, I've been a little sick this morning, but other than that, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. But you, you had a good day one, a pretty good record. Yep. So walk us through it. How did it go? You, you dropped two matches yesterday? Uh, no, I had one draw and one loss yesterday. And then my first round today, I lost against Thomas Rose. Okay. Thomas Rose is one of those guys you can actually lose to. Yeah. It's, it's fine. But you, you bounced back, you won the last round, and now you're very, very close to making it to the top cut. So how are you feeling about your chances in this match? I guess they're like 50-50. It depends on what my opponent's playing. But All right. And how are you feeling about playing here in the feature match area? I mean, like, I'm already pretty nervous if I play on the normal tables, but now I'm even more nervous, so I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's all right. All the Swiss duelists are going to be rooting for you. Please have a seat over here. Thank you very much. His opponent is Brian Smadia from France. Brian, please come over here. Oh, oh. Okay, we got some French duelists in the room. Why are you not playing in the main event anymore? Just kidding. Brian, how did you get here? You got here on Friday, right? Yes. And you traveled by car, by plane? Yeah. By car? Car. By car, all right. And how did your day one go? Are you happy with your deck choice? Yes, very happy. Very happy. Are you nervous about playing in the feature match now? A little. A little bit, all right, all right. I see you, you're keeping your cool. Please have a seat as well. All right. I think Brian is a little bit more nervous, so maybe we can hear it from his friends from France again. Can you give it up for Brian? And who is rooting for Thomas from Switzerland? Ooh, oh, wow, wow. No pressure. Okay, please come here, Thomas. Let's do the die roll and see who's going to go first. So we got a high roll with two dice. Thomas got a five and a two. That's very average. That's a seven. And Brian's got a five. So Thomas can decide who goes first. I'd like to start. Thomas likes to start. All right, with that. The stage has been set, our players are ready. Let's take it away, guys. We got Daniel Neville and Marcello Barberi on commentary. And we're in round 12, the final round of Swiss. This is the most crucial round for these two players. They need to get their head in the game, they need to focus, and they need to stay calm. What are your thoughts when you're playing in a match like this? Uh, I'd say that like outside of the finals, it's probably the most important match of the day because it's uh, all or nothing. So you, when you play in the bubble match, uh, it's the it's really stressful. But you should try and keep your calm and maybe capitalize on your opponent mistakes if that's the case. And for these guys, they don't seem to be the most experienced players in this kind of scenario. And playing on stream might be even harder for them. Uh, we saw, of course, uh, the French players will help uh, uh, with uh, Brian being um, a little bit like feeling home at this table. And uh, we have to say, even though we'll wait for them to mic up, that we have a new deck that we have not shown on stream yet. Exactly. So, um, we, we definitely have gone exciting for this. 12 rounds, and we have not seen the same matchup twice. Yes. Which is really crazy. Which is really impressive. And uh, even if, like, Salomon Great will, of course, show up in the top cut, because we saw it was the most played deck, yeah. we're definitely waiting on the other decks. We're sure that the top cut will be pretty much reflecting what this event was about, different it's decks. It's going to be very diverse. And yeah. I'm really excited for that. I love when we have formats like this, where there's everything going on. 
uh, it, it really challenges people with deck building, right? Because exactly. it's kind of a case of like, can you find a chink in the format where you're able to, like th there's a flaw in the armor of all of the other decks and you're able to capitalize on that yeah. and just break the format apart? Exactly, and while Thomas decided to capitalize on the latest deck, Salomon yeah. Great, we have Brian who maybe out of uh, the win at YCS Milan thought, why not, let's try it again, and he's on Prank Kids. Yeah. So this is going to be an interesting matchup. We have seen Prank Kids with Dean Kabui take uh, YCS Milan by a blast, yeah. but now Salomon Great wasn't on deck there. So what's uh, most curious about is this matchup, because this is the deciding matchup to see if Prank Kids can do it again, or if Prank Kids is going to be substituted by the new deck. Yeah, and an advantage that Prank Kids had going into Milan was definitely people weren't very familiar with the deck. Now that Milan has raised its kind of profile, is that going to hurt the deck? We're going to find out very shortly. Exactly. Yeah. Let's go to the table. OK, so Thomas is going to go first. Uh, it seems like he has a pretty good end. I mean, you don't want to draw the Sanctuary, because you can just search it. Yes. But as long as you have your engine going, you're fine. And he has both a spin and a circle. So yep. it should be good to go. On the other hand, we can see one of the few touches from Brian, which is the reasoning. It's a pretty cool interaction with the deck. You have a lot of different levels and... Reasoning is quite exciting because, particularly game one, your opponent doesn't know what you're playing. Um, I always get anxious when I see reasoning. Yep. have flashbacks to Infernoid Decatron. Oh my, oh my. <laughs> and when you don't call the Decatron, they summon like a Jinzo or something. Yeah. Um, so I like reasoning in formats like this because it's such a wild card format that I often think that players are obliged to answer the reasoning with an Ash Blossom or with a negation. And then that can often leave them vulnerable to the other stuff that your deck wants to be doing. So sure. we'll see if it's able to push and take cards. Exactly. The only thing I'm worried about is that he's playing Antrops in the main deck. So reasoning kind of conflicts with that. He's playing Effect Vader and you definitely don't want to see that with reasoning. So. We'll see if that works out for him. He sadly has no Trishula to go into here. <laughs> yeah. Um. But the end is looking really good. He has Inter Eastern Fusion, the Fuel Spell. No, the Fuel Spell? Yeah. Uh, I believe or Pranks the is No, the no, no. It's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the Quick Spell. Or yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the Fusion. And Desires, which is obviously a really good card to fish for more. Because honestly, in the Prank Kids decks, there isn't anything... Uh, you really are afraid of banishing. Most of your decks is just free of, so you're good to go in that sense. Exactly. Um, Belly Lynx has really been performing quite well this event. Not only does it let you search your field spell in the deck, yep. and the field spell is very important for your Sunlight Wolf combos, but then it's also been protecting the Salmon Great deck. And so it kind of, in the way that Sky Striker has Ray, so that it can remain on board even when the opponent exactly. is pushing aggression. Uh, Bailing allows you to perform similarly with the Salmon Great. Yeah, deck. and it's quite unique in the sense that outside of Sky Strikers, we haven't really seen many Link ones that are so powerful by themselves. Yes. So it is quite a good card. Yeah, this is a Link one that you are very happy to summon. Exactly. Whereas things like Car Clara and Rushka, which is a very powerful yeah. card, at the same time has the issue that it's such a sacrifice to summon it. Yeah. And it's also like not good on his own, it's good because of the deck you're playing. Well, Bailinx is actually a really good monster. It has a lot of effects both on field and grave. So it yes. uh, seems like even overstated for just a Link 1. So it's pretty good. Now we're going to see the regular opening. Uh, we get into the Sunlight Wolf, get back the Jaguar so we can get uh, both the Rage and the Roar since he yes. opened one. And uh, with a Twin Twister to back that up, he has a lot of removal for uh, back rows. Yeah, it seems like quite a nice opening. I'm not sure how relevant the Twin Twisters will be. It means that he can destroy the pranks and deny yep. the token. So he could gain value there, but we aren't sure yet how likely Brian is to commit to the pranks as he already has so many yeah. other extender cards. At least, I mean, you can use it on the field spell whenever Brian uses yeah. it, but it's, I mean, there is a word in which you can also wait for the end phase or and yep, if you are sure. able to do that, then it can be pretty devastating for the Prank Kids deck. Because mm -hmm. usually turn one is the setup turn, let's say. Yes. And then you yep. go off uh, on the next one. So 
We'll have to see whether or not the prank kids deck is capable of exactly. getting it set up through this board. And so he goes for the bailings uh, just to prevent any kaijus in the mag deck. You never know what you're playing against. And let's see. Also, something that's cool to mention, but I guess it's more for experienced player, is when you get a future match, at some points, unless you're in the top card already, you can predict that if you are the one playing the meta, maybe your opponent is playing something different. That's sometimes the case. So reasoning comes down, and let's see what it... Thomas, what would you call if that was the case? You don't know your opponent um, deck. I mean, I'm generally going to be playing around Infernoids. Yeah. I think that is the scariest thing that I can, can encounter here. Sure. But sure. you're definitely not going to call level 2, and that's what the prank kids revealed. Like, you're calling 1 or 4. I'd say so. Uh, unless you think they're playing some sort of blue eyes -y deck, or like... Yeah, I, I think 1 and 4 are generally the correct things. Yeah. At the moment, probably 4, because you can play Reasoning and Sky Striker if you want. Yeah. If you're playing no hand traps, it gets you into Ray, and it gets a bunch of spells engraved. Sure. Sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't mill anything, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, it, it's kind of a cute card that you can try it out. It is. So, so he does get the drop seas, I believe, and now he has uh, the pranks. We'll see if he wants to use the twin twister there. It doesn't seem like he's super familiar with the deck, but I think he might as well. Instead, he chooses to use uh, the rage, so he's gonna destroy both the pranks and the drop seas. That's quite a powerful play here because he still has his counter trap set up. Exactly. Uh, we will see if Brian is able to find... Now Desires come down desires. and you have to negate this. Yeah, I, I think it's counter. very reasonable to do that. He does negate and now Brian is left with Eastern Fusion and Cold by the Grave. Definitely not ideal, but... That is certainly not a great place to be in for the Prank Kids player. Uh, he kind of needs his two monsters to start doing his yeah. link climb. And that doesn't give him access. And unfortunately, again, his opponent had quite a good opening. But his opponent now knows that he's playing Prank Kids. So exactly. it, it means that Thomas has more information on what to go. I, I think Brian had a strong enough hand though that it made sense to try and play true. Yeah. But perhaps there was a better way to navigate it knowing that because he saw the roar or he saw the rage, he just hadn't seen the roar, right? Exactly. And if well, you can predict it if depending your on the match. If your opponent's getting rage blind first, yeah. then we probably know that. Anyway, so Thomas uh, gets the game one. Uh, well done for him. And um, now we are moving to the side decks. Uh, it will come down to how much Thomas prepared for this matchup. I mean, the deck got a lot of attention after Dinka won with it, so it's possible that he knows what's up. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his side deck, uh, uh, he has a few generic cards that you can side in this matchup. Um, yeah, so... I mean, realistically here, we're expecting Brian to go first, right? Of course. Like, th there's no reason to go second against decks that are able to end with counter trap cards in yeah. my mind. Um, so, on under that assumption, we have cards like Pankertops. Are we considering bringing that in in the Salmon Great deck? Um, I mean, going first, you mean? Well, or, no, in the Salmon. The Salmon. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's uh, it's possible. Like, it's not it's not that bad. It can. You can basically force the quick uh, spell fusion, and then maybe you get rid of something else. Um, definitely not ideal, but it sure. can get you there, because, I mean, at the end of the world, you can still get a lot of advantage out of it. I, I think for Brian's Prank Kids, the only thing I'd be looking at and considering would be Denko Seka or Twin Twister. Yeah. Uh, realistically, I'm not super keen on Denko Seka when I'm going first against the deck. Going second, I think we're definitely seeing Denko brought For in. sure. But I think Twin Twisters is reasonable if there are cards that he wants to cut in favor of it. Like, it's possibly more impactful than Called by the Grave. But Called by the Grave also it's has so also much It's also really good, so I, I don't yeah. think I would side that out. I mean, you can consider siding out Phantasmai, I guess, and maybe Valor. Yeah. But they also have their purposes going second, uh, going first. So um, we'll have to see. He doesn't necessarily need to side much, because when you go first with Prank Kids, 
uh, especially in this matchup, you're honestly good to go. If yeah. they don't stop you and it's quite difficult to do so unless you brick, then you're able to establish a very good field. And uh, yeah, it seems like it's uh, it's a pretty good matchup in that sense. I'm looking forward to see what build, what board the Prankins player builds. Yeah, because it's one of those really fun decks. It's very. I feel nostalgic about Ritual Beasts when I see Prank Kids being played. There's a similar amount of just kind of tagging out shenanigans as you bounce yeah, through it's crazy. all your Depending different... on the opening, you can do a lot. You can do even Totally Awesome can get you there. He's playing a Beast yeah. Dweller. So he has a lot of different opening options. So What do you prioritize trying to end on something like a Beast Dweller in this matchup? As um, Salman so heavily reliant on it. He's graveyard. definitely good against it, but I'd say that if you just play it as a value game, yeah. you shouldn't be losing anytime soon. Okay. So the Salomon Grey is really good at doing the same thing every turn, but it doesn't have like massive removals. So if you float a lot, that's going to be a problem for If them. you manage to build your board wide enough, yeah. then you don't care that your opponent... Exactly. Is. And that's what basically Dinka was doing uh, in Milan. He wasn't really interacting with the opponent. He was basically just doing his own thing. And, and that's something that Thunder Dragons was really struggling yeah. with at the time, right? Because Thunder Dragons was like, I have these massive guys, but I can only attack so many times in exactly. a turn. Exactly. And then you keep floating, and whenever you want, you just pull the trigger with the bottle's word and bottle load. So... He opens uh, with Twin Twisters going first, which is not great, but it doesn't seem like it's the bad. Yeah, we I, can I, show I think Twin Twisters is fine. Yeah, it means that you don't have to set up as important a board. Yeah, it's because you can clear the trap cards when they're definitely. set. Definitely. The only unfortunate thing is that he opened the two prankies with the same name, yeah. so he will only be able to resolve one. Uh, is that is the sad thing with the deck. Yeah. The fact that all of the prank kids are named once per turns, which means he won't get the maximum value he could have gotten here. Exactly. And again, we see polymerization. Classic Yu Gi Oh card. Classic Yu Gi Oh yeah. card, yeah. Uh, and I loved seeing that int integration in like every deck of the format seems to have something old that it's playing. It is, it is happening. Okay, and we're and reading Rocket Ride because that card has a lot of stuff. It is on. really good. So yeah, the fusions basically summon back from grave, while the Link Monsters add back from grave. Yeah. That's the basic distinction. And then you have one of each. One you can use during your turn, and one during your opponent's turn. That's the yeah. basic concept of the deck. And uh, yeah, as we said, it's basically just trying to make as much advantage as possible while getting more Frankies from the deck because as Every time you use them for fusion or link material, they summon another prank kit from deck. Yeah. So, so the really cool thing with how the prank kit deck works is yeah. it kind of has a two-turn setup, right? Exactly. Because, like you said, the fusion summon back from graveyard. So the idea is that you climb into the links using the fusions on the first turn, and then on the second turn, when you summon the fusions, you get to summon the links back. And so instead of getting two cards worth of value, you're getting four cards worth of value. Yeah. Um, and you just kind of get carried away with yourself from there. <laughs> so unfortunately for Thomas, he opens again the Sanctuary twice in a row. You don't want to do that, but... That's unfortunate, but it also looks like his hand should be able to access um, at least three trap cards in setup. Yes. So that means that he's not going to be completely left stranded sure. after the Twin Twister. But something important to mention is that the prank kids have access to a uh, heavy storm. Uh, heavy, uh, heavy storm. Feather yeah, Harpy Feather Duster. Yeah, Harpy Feather basically. Yeah. So the Link 4, uh, as we said, the Link Choose and the level 5 fusions are working that way with adding a special summoning. But then they have two boss monsters where the fusion is a Regeki and yes. uh, the Link Monster is uh, RP Feather Duster. So depending on the matchup, you can try and set it up so that in the end phase, you just clear all your opponent monsters or back rows. So setting that many traps is not good against prank kids. They, they also just have massive attack and defense points. Yeah, of well, course. The Link Monster only has attack, but that's the cherry yeah. on top. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> um, so we have Doodle Doo, and now we are and now we have Bow Wow. Bow -wow. The names of these cards are yeah. amazing. <laughs> Bow Wow Bar. Even the artworks are really cool. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and so we see the Prankid player. He's able to set up his graveyard. He's yes. able to add cards back if he needs to. And these are quick effects, which means they get to interact really favorably against interaction. And I think this is something at Milan, where Prank Kids has a better matchup against Striker because it has these quick effects it can use. Sure. Whereas against Salomon Great, again, counter trap cards are much more of a problem for this kind of deck than a Widow Anchor is. Definitely, definitely a big change from there on. And um, I mean, it's, it's showing up. Of course, Prank Kids was never really the one of the most played decks, but I mean, Brian is quite close to topping with it, so it still means that the deck has something to say. Yeah. So we're summoning Roxy's, which is the newest Pranked. It was part of yeah. the Soul Fusion Special Edition as a preview for the current set, and then it was released in the current set as well. And up until this was released, the deck definitely struggled a lot more, but having that extra name is super relevant. It's... Um, it's kind of like Goki, where when Goki first came out in Code of the Duelist, it had strong effects, but it didn't have a critical mass of names. Yeah. And Burning Abyss is similar as well, where as you get more names, you kind of gain yeah, more power. Plays, just, yeah, more extenders, yeah. yeah. So he decides that he wants to get rid of Twin Twisters, which might come back to Aunt him, but as we said, he might just get to the... RP Feather Duster anyway, so, yes. yeah. and he gets the plan. I mean, the Harpy Feather Duster, Ardor Igeki, either is sufficient, because yes. if you're clearing one, like, the cards in the Salmon Great deck are so reliant on each other, where you need monsters and spells to interact. Exactly, though at the same time, Bale Links protects from the Regeki, that is and true. it's uh, quite easy to uh, set it up, so. I would definitely be in favor of setting up the Harpy Feather Duster yes. effect. And that seems to be what he is going for. Oh, so he, he drew is. into the plan, which is exactly how you summon during your opponent turn the Harpy Feather Duster. Yeah. Because you can link summon during your opponent turn. And then there's a cool grave effect with shouldn't come up un until it's removed from the field. Yeah, the graveyard effect is really relevant on that card. Yes. Uh, and often you'll see that they send it off a card like Roxy's yeah. before they, um, without actually ever putting it into play. They just set it up for protection. Yeah. Usually that's the, that's the play. Now Thomas gets the Gazelle. Nice uh, little pickup. Yeah, Gazelle is really nice. He has two Salmon Great Monsters, and we see that that's kind of your critical mass in the Salmon Great deck yeah. to get online. And now he reveals, uh, actually misses, and that's a big deal. I mean, it's unlikely that he'll get an oppor It's unlikely he'll get a good opportunity to activate Foxy's other effect, so I think it definitely was right to go for the reveal, but it is very unfortunate that he doesn't pick up any cards. For sure. There. And now we're going back into our Salmon Great combo. And again, it's just super consistent. It doesn't get hurt too badly by interaction yeah. from the opponent. Because, you know, they can Veiler or they can Ash, but you still get your guys on board, and you start to try and progress and build the board up. Gazelle is really just showing itself to yeah, be Yeah, Gazelle is probably MVP of the, deck. the best card in the deck by far. It it's so easy to summon it because it's one of those unique cards where uh, it's hard, it doesn't really miss timing and it's really good. You can use it even when you detach, so it's, it's such a great card. Yeah. And, and we there see we see the pandemonium fusion. activated. Exactly. Prank Kids Pandemonium. Yeah. Excellent naming. And here we are going to see both. So yeah. he was with this opening, he was able to actually have both the Regagi and the Feather Duster. This opening is insane. Which is, yeah, the best opening that I can wish for. So that's the Butler and... The Battle Butler. Yeah. We're going to uh, show it real quick. He doesn't have a Link Arrow to summon, so he'll need to use the Butler effect before he'll be able to summon the Link 4, I believe. Yes. Because yeah. now... It's the perfect moment because Bale Lynx is not even in the graveyard. He can't protect anything. Exactly. And he basically cleared the board. And he clears the board, which means there's no Salmon Great Monsters yeah, on and field. And he still gets free well. rankings from deck, which is yeah. insane. 
also something uh, worth mentioning is that as you can see there was no battle phase but the life points different is still relevant because the prank kids monsters have additional effects yeah. they're really good at gaining life points and so they're really good in time so so dropsies gains a thousand yeah um the fire one lampsies Lamp burns for 500, 500 yeah then Roxy's sends from deck to grave, I believe. Sure. Um, and the last one is the new one, which banishes one from end to draw a card. Right. Yes. So Roxy's, Roxy's Roxy's banishes to yeah. draw, and Fanzies is the one yeah. that sends from deck to graveyard. So now Wheel of the Salaman Great comes down. Uh, we haven't really seen it yet this weekend. It's basically a monster reborn, and. Yeah, and this can give an opportunity to get back into the game because he has the Spinny in Graveyard, so he can revive the Gazelle and then summon Spinny. Sure. But Friends. we know that everything is there, so he, he will be able to go into the Frank Kids roster as well. So. Yes. Yeah. Reading Gazelle. Probably thinking about what he's wanting to do here. Mm -hmm. Gazelle is going to attack over Lampsies. We're activating Prank Kids' plan. plan. So he gets to shuffle any number of Prank Kids' cards from his graveyard back into his deck. And then Gazelle is going to lose 100 attack for each card. And so this card's like really interesting because not only does it protect your monsters, but it also just gives you all of your material back so yeah. that you can go back through your combo the next turn. It, it's kind of funny because I think there's a lot of similarities here between these two decks in that they have very consistent lines of play in how they do their general combo. Indeed. But Salaman has a smaller engine. Uh, but it also has that lower ceiling that we were mentioning earlier. Yeah. But now it's going to be a big deal. It gets a lot of resources back. And um, we can see from the end of Thomas that he doesn't have many resources left. He has only trap cards, basically. Yeah. And they don't line up well against uh, Brian Field. No, unfortunately not. Uh, we are going to see a Link Summon for another Bay Links. And now it's just gonna end, and that's what we're gonna see. The plan is used, and he will be summoning the Link 4, which is the RP Feather Duster, which will be a huge deal here. It was his plan all along. I mean, <laughs> both players were aware. We saw the plan being added, right? Yeah, plan was yeah. the plan. Plan was the plan. It's just a prank and all that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and th this is going to be massive. Because yeah. you have the bailings and you have a protection for it. But he only has a sanctuary in hand and nothing else. I think you would need to draw a foxy, get good reveals off it to get back into the game yeah. here. And that is possible. And hopefully Thomas will be able to get that. But at the moment he is looking in a very precarious spot. And it's unfortunate because... If he were able to commit to the board earlier uh, and make his opponent destroy the stuff first, then when he summoned a he would he be able to set Roar? Or does Roar need it to be the same name? Yeah, it's the same. You, ju you just use the... Oh, okay, yeah. Bailings. So he couldn't even set the Roar. Um, oh, so and the big up. Frank is wow. Frank is place is picked up. That is the top deck that you want to see. Here. Exactly. <laughs> uh, for people who don't know, Frank is place is similar to Trickstar Light Stage. In yes. It plays and it immediately searches a Frank is monster from your deck to your it's hand. It's essentially the same thing, and now it's looking very grim for Thomas. He can basically go into a similar combo what we've seen before. It's a really good spot now. Yeah. Thomas needs to get a really good draw here to get himself back on the board. But I think if he does draw well, he definitely still is in what it's Sure, has. sure. It's not over yet, but it's definitely a really good pickup. And we get Lampsies. Uh, and this is the thing, the deck, like we're just seeing a life points dispar disparity appear 
just as Brian is just playing his game. Yes. Like, he's not attacked yet, but he has so much more life points than his opponent. Okay, so we're activating the Grave Effect, we're activating Palace Effect, or Place Effect. I remember when Milan happened, and you heard Prank Kids was in the finals, and then just suddenly, all of the groups that I'm in, everybody was like, looking for Prank Kids plays. <laughs> it, it went from something where people were pulling it in their packs and were like, yeah. oh, to just like, oh wait, this is like a real deck. And it, it really is, and particularly it's one of those decks that because it's less common, people it don't give is. it enough time, and they don't learn how to play around it. But I think both of these players seem relatively comfortable in this matchup. Like, Thomas doesn't seem confused yeah, by what's going on. Yeah, too surprised. I mean, he had a few reads, but that's normal. It's I mean, with this deck, even when I know what's happening, I'm still reading the cards. Of course. Just to make sure. Uh, it, it's one of those things where... You know, you're pretty sure you know the card, but it's so crucial to make sure that you definitely have the right effect on the right card. Yeah, and you want to make sure you read everything when you're playing on the bubble at the biggest YCS you've ever attended. Exactly. So. <laughs> I think the biggest YCS that pretty much anybody here has ever yeah. attended. Until the next one. Until the Just next keep growing. <laughs> okay. And it looks like we're going to, we're adding back two cards with the doodle doodle do. Gets the pandemonium back as well, so you can go into some fusion plays. Looks like he added pandemonium and fancies. Yeah. Sure. Pandemonium. Although pandemonium itself is a separate card entirely. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Franken's pandemonium is a really good card. Uh, the deck does love having access to its fusion summons. We see yep. that in addition to polymerization and pandemonium, uh, invocation. Brian is also playing the one invocation, so he has seven fusion spells in his main deck. And then instant fusion, which does fusion summon technically, yep. but it's not quite the same. <laughs> so, damage over. Or right, we've not attacked yet. And that's the thing, this deck just keeps summoning monsters from the deck. Okay, so a drops is was added to hand. So he will get two summons. Have you tested prank kids at all? Have you ever considered dabbling in the deck? Um I mean, I of course picked it up after Dinka won with it, but mm -hmm. I I don't know, I wasn't really a fan of it. Because yeah. basically there was a moment in which everyone switched to super heavy combo decks, and I don't feel yes. like the deck is well positioned against it. But now that we got Salaman Great and Sky Strikers getting popular again, I feel like it could be a good decision. A contender in the format. Yeah. Yeah, and I think again, like, from my point of view, I'm liking the decks that are less caring about what the opponent is doing and prank is sure. as we're seeing here it has a lot of its plan which is just i have my cycle and i have my rotation each turn and i'm yep. trying to resolve that um, and as we see like even just in building his board he's gaining life pa point advantage he's gaining card advantage yeah, he's dealing damage and that's one of the best part of these decks is when you get two time, you it's pretty easy to win like that as well. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we have about 15 minutes left in the round, uh, so we have to keep in mind that because this game is looking in Brian's favor, of course. Yes. But that would mean that they need to be careful about how much time is left because they don't want to draw in this spot. And who? Yes, you don't want to draw in this spot. Who who do you think is more concerned about going to time? For like sure, Thomas. Yeah. As we said, uh, Brian doesn't really have to do much to have an, a life point uh, advantage. Yeah. He's running six monsters in his deck, all which yeah. alter life points. Yeah, literally, we still haven't seen a battle phase uh, yeah. from him. And He's look at the... 4,600 yeah. life points ahead. Exactly, which is yeah, quite a casual. big deal. Yeah. 
He's building quite a board here. Yeah, and he's going to battle phase. He's going to attack the Balinx. Thomas is like, no, nah, I'm just going to let it go to the graveyard. He does have another one in graveyard, right? Yeah, yeah, he does. Um, do you think you protect it there, or? Yeah, if you do, m you might as well. Yeah. But he picks it up. Uh, he sees the line, and uh, congratulations to Brian. So we are gonna go to a game three. It's 1-1 uh, right now, and uh, when we have just a little bit more than 10 minutes into the round, we go to game three. And now Brian uh, is going to go second. Yes. And we saw that his side deck is basically built for going second. Mm -hmm. Since, as you could see, when he goes first, depending on a good opening hand, he can have both a Regeki and a Feather Storm Duster. Yep. So um, now he has... He can even side up to 15. Of course, he's not going to do it, <laughs> but like every for card sure. he has is really good for going second. Yeah, I, I'm thinking here, so Denko Seka is looking sure. good. I think evenly matched can be played here. Like, we know that we're coming up close to time, um, but we also don't care as much about the battle phase mm -hmm. as other decks would. So, you know, we can use our battle phase for evenly matched so that we can then just start doing our prank yeah. kids combo and just slowly gaining that incremental life gain. Definitely. The Punker drops are also looking good. And on Thomas' side, he's going to add in a few more traps. Mm -hmm. Like I see he's siding Solemn Warning, for example, which yes. is, of course, for Danko. And those kind of cards can definitely come in, being careful about the time, of course. But he should be fine if uh, there is enough time. So. so in formats where I'm concerned about Denko Psycho, there yeah. is a card called Chaos Trap Hole. For sure. I remember which, it. Yes. Uh, it's, it comes in a night of formats. Do you think we might be moving towards a format where it could be considered for play? Um, could be the case, but it is usually played when there are decks that relies on light and darks uh, as well. It could be the case because we have Thunder Dragons, for example. Yes. But it needs just that little bit of recurrency where even if they don't have the Danko against all decks in the format, you can still use it. Yeah. And we got recently Solemn Judgment back, so that helps with this decision because even just yeah. Judgment and Warning are really two solid cards that are perfectly fine even if they don't Danko. So. Yep, for sure. And... I mean, we have seen a lot of decks in this event and leading up to this event, which were playing the full set of five Solemn cards, yeah. Triple Strike, One Warning, and a Judgment. Nobody's playing Scalding, but uh, perhaps days. not the format for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, Scalding also is much less appealing now that we just have Judgment in the format. I, I think most decks that would have played Scolding will happily just play yeah, a Scolding, Judgment and a Warning uh, instead. Yeah, Scolding was a pretty good card, but as you said, now Judgment is back, so you might as well consider it. So now, let's see. Thomas is trying to go for the usual opener. Uh, the best case scenario was just like Game 1, when you get both the Roar and the Rage, but it's quite rare. Like, you usually need to draw yeah. one of them to be able to. I think if he can get a solid setup, he's probably favored in this matchup. Yeah. Again, we saw even with a reasonably active hand, Brian had difficulty. Again, though, side deck cards seem like they could be very important in this matchup. And they could swing the game towards whoever sees more of them. So, we see polymerization, but all we're interested in now is Thomas and for now. Yes. So we we know that he doesn't play any rank fours, I believe. I don't see Dweller or Baguska, so it's not like he's gonna try and go for that combo. And, and Dweller is quite good against this. Deck. Indeed, indeed, and yeah, they're both really good. So he opens two call by the grave and a pretty good end, honestly. It's really solid. He will be able to end on like four back rows if uninterrupted. Yeah. And he has outs for the hand trap. So he well, would usually... The only hand trap that he's afraid of here is Valor. He, yeah, but he has call by the grave. So yeah, it would exactly. be the impermanence, I guess. That's the worst one here. Yes. Yeah. But if uh, impermanence doesn't come down, then 
You should be able to end with uh, Rage, uh, Rage Roar and Double Cold, yeah. which is going to be a huge deal here. Uh, having the Call by the Grave for the Prankids cards is massive. Yes. Like, I'm, I'm not sure how the deck will deal with Double Called by the Grave, because the line that I see with Brian's hand would be Polymerization, yeah. Fuse two Prank Kids, make a fusion, use their effect to summon guys from deck. But if the guys summoned from deck get, or if the effects get called by the Grave, then suddenly you have a fusion monster that can summon back to just Link materials. That's yeah, all Yeah, and the be. problem is that, I mean, when you play against Prank Kids and you're not familiar with it, you see all these little guys floating from deck, from grave, but in the end, there are only four different names. So it's not like they have infinite Prank Kids cards. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If, uh, as you said, two are negated by Cold by the Grave, you're only left with two Prank Kids. It's not, not a comfortable position. Yeah, yeah. So nothing special here. We see the opening uh, with Sino Weaken. You get the trap you're missing with Rage and Roar, and that's what you usually end on. Uh, he goes for the Bay Links to play around Kaijus, and he's just going to set four back rows, most likely. Do you think Prank Kids is the deck that could play Sphere Mode if it wanted? Uh, or do you sure. think a Kaiju would be more likely? I mean... I wouldn't see, I mean, he could play both, but he can't afford the Sphere Mode in the way that he does play the Ankoseka, so he can't afford not using the normal summon. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem that important. And here it would have been. Dankoseka here. Yeah, Dankoseka would have been, nice. been really good here. Unfortunately, he does not draw it, and that would have changed the game entirely. Now yeah. he's weak to the Cold by the Graves. Let's see if Thomas is going to use them. Oh, actually, he can chain Rocket to yeah. the Cold by the Graves. Exactly. So. There is space for mistakes here. Because if he chains Rocket to Cult by the Graves, but unfortunately his opponent can just negate the Rocket with the Counter Trap. Yeah, and the problem I'm seeing is that he's going to chain it to the first Cult by the Grave, and then you can use Cult by the Grave on Rocket as well. Yeah, so that is completely true. Uh, let's see how this lines up. Thomas should definitely just chain one at a time. You don't want to reveal more information. Well, he has to go chain one, wait for a response. Of course, but sometimes, you know, they just get caught in the action and they just flip both. Yeah. Which is the case <laughs> here. Uh, Brian is thinking. And Brian knows what the other two sets are here. So it's quite a difficult position. Okay. Doesn't chain it. This feels really bad for him. Yeah. And now he picks up the Ash Blossom too late for the party. Uh, place is gonna try and help, but we know that Rage and Roar are in Thomas' field, so he can deal with both the fuel spell and whatever is there left. Now, yeah, Rage is gonna deal with everything he has, and the handshake That's comes the down. Nice uh, crowd uh, cheering for now, so let's go to the post match discussion and see. It was well played by Thomas. He well played. had a difficult game too, but he kept together and he kept focused and he made sure to take his time. He read the cards and made sure that he was happy yeah. with what interactions were going on. He basically spent game one trying to understand what was going on, if he had any more doubts about the matchup, but it seems like he quickly uh, catch up. And then even though game two, we got to see the best opening for the deck, yeah. which was really cool. He went for both the butler and the roaster, which means no monsters, no spell and traps, which is pretty hard to deal with. Yeah. Uh, in game three, unfortunately, uh, we had the, pretty much the same thing as game one. Uh, even worse because he couldn't really out the field. Double call by the grave on Prank Kids was really, really good. And uh, we can only say congratulations to Thomas. Um, he should be locked in for top 64. I don't want to bring him bad luck, so let's not say that for now. And uh, we're going to be back uh, soon enough with all the data you've been looking for. We know that you want to see what's yes. in the top cut. But first, let's go to Oliver for the interview. If 
we're gonna say one more though that we saw the crowd was really cheerful for Brian. So congratulations to him as well. He had a pretty good run. He represented yes. the deck yeah. very well and he got really close. So congrats to him. I'm sure he will be able to have some luck in the future. I mean, just seeing a Danko or something, he would have been good. Exactly. He didn't need much more, but let's see what Thomas thinks of the match now. Thank you very much, Marcello and Daniel. That was it, the last round of Swiss, and you made it into the top cut. Congratulations. Thanks. So that was quite the back and forth between you two. Uh, it's very fair to say that you are not that familiar with the prank hits deck, right? Definitely not. I was playing it the first time, uh, so I was pretty scared of the cars. I knew where they had like board wipes and stuff. Yeah. It's a pretty good deck, and a lot of people were caught by surprise when it did so so well actually in Milan when uh, Team Cup we won the event with it. So how do you feel about the deck now after that match? Um, Would you like to play it or try it out? Uh, honestly, I like my deck, and maybe one day, but. Not right now. Yeah, yeah, not right now. <laughs> okay, well that's fine. I mean, you're obviously comfortable with your own deck, and it, it got you there. Uh, when you started playing in this tournament, did you imagine that you're going to make day two and the top card? Um, I was hoping for it surely, but uh, since I didn't play for half a year earlier, so I didn't really expect to really make it so far. But right. And has it settled in already? Like, have you realized that you're now in the top card, or are you still still processing? Still processing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's fine. Take all the time you need. Okay, we saw that um, it made a big difference not knowing some of the cards that your opponent was playing. In the second duel, um, you were in a situation where it seemed like you could maybe not win the game anymore, but you still kept in there. So, in hindsight, do you think it would have been better to um, give up in that second duel to have more time for the third duel? Uh, no, I think, like, uh, considering the first ga game, I won it pretty quickly, so I knew uh, if it comes to a third game, I can win that just like during his first turn just uh, but the problem was I uh, made at least two misplays right and if I di wouldn't have made them uh, I would have won the second game too but and the misplays were because you were not a hundred percent familiar with the other deck uh, no I just uh, didn't think enough about my own cards because I should first of all I shouldn't have activated Foxy so I could have popped uh, his face-up trap, and then second of all, uh, if he still would have been able to uh, wipe my back row, I should have uh, activated the field spell and then uh, just uh, linked the fox, uh, the bailings in itself, just uh, to set the country trap, and then he's left the top checking too, and from there on, if I drew, draw Salmon Grade, I win. Yeah, but you seem to have a really good process, like going over the matches in your head again. So how important is that? And is that one of the things that, that helps you get better and become a better duelist in general? Uh, yeah, I think it definitely helps to get better, but you have to play a lot of tournaments to really make a difference. And since I didn't really attend that much big events, I still have to learn a lot. <laughs> right. Well, no problem. You got some friends in the audience. They might go over some of the plays for you and give you some advice. And well, now you are in the top cut, so you got a little bit of time to, to breathe and calm down. And then we can see how it goes. Top 64. So congratulations again. Thank Thanks. you very much. Let's hope to see you again later. Thank you guys very much. We got 17 minutes on the clock. Uh, speaking from experience, we have roughly 30 minutes on overtime in between rounds, sometimes even more. And since this was the last round of Swiss, we of course do bring up the final standings after this round. And then all the players have roughly 5 to 10 minutes to verify that they are in the correct standing um, and are going to be advancing to the top card or not. Which means we got some more time to play some Yu-Gi-Oh games. That means we're going to go to a quick commercial. You guys are going to see some of the pre-recorded contents on Friday. Then we're going to be back here on the main event stage, live and in color of course. And we're going to be playing for some more playmats, socks and booster packs. So don't go anywhere if you want to win some cool prizes. Just stay here in front of the feature match area and you might be next and can win some booster packs. First hands are already going up. That's the spirit. Okay guys, see you very soon in just a few seconds.